thank you. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Uh, and thank you for the invitation of Aiden and also the, uh, the, data, the Python uh, data group there as well. Um, so, so thank you for coming to talk. Uh, so I just want to talk a little bit about uh, data, which I think I feel I'm preaching to the choir a little bit here. I'm sure everyone here uh, is quite interested in data. Can I actually just take a quick survey? How many here are currently employed as a data scientist of some form or another? And so how long, in, uh, in the rest of you are interested in data science or get, get, want to get into that? Is that correct? So that's great. So maybe um, you could consider also our NUS uh, master's programs. Um, just a quick pitch, <laughs> that out of the way. Um, but, wait, but if not, also I want to kind of uh, talk a little bit about kind of maybe a big picture of analytics and what we're doing, but then talk about how we should be actually more responsible on the way that we do analytics. Um, if you're familiar with analytics, then you, you maybe you can uh, understand, get a little bit of a perspective on this. But if you're not, just kind of also keep this on the back of your mind as you're learning more about analytics. Okay, and what we can do, what we can interpret, and how we can use the data. So that's kind of the, the motivation for this. Um, and so, just, you know, I love data. After this talk, it might see, seem like I don't like data, but that's not the case. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, visualizations. Um, an article in, in Science looking at the food network, how all the recipes and uh, how they're related to each other. So they, they analyzed over several hundred thousand recipes worldwide. I'm um, looking at the ingredients and the flavor networks. So the ties are when the, the ingredients are connected to each other. So you see like, like olive oil is connected to olive um, uh, items. Garlic and onion is commonly used and there's a strong tie between them. So it's, it's, it's a really nice uh, use and you, know, you can immediately see uh, these trends and these patterns in recipes, right? So you can look up this, this article um, to get more detail on that. But let me just, uh, as I've alluded a little bit, let me just kind of explain like, kind of my journey to get to, to where I am right now doing data. Okay, now I, I at least help you understand, you know, I think where the industry is going, and we're seeing a lot of people following a similar journey as well. Uh, so as, as I've mentioned, so I actually started really in the tech sector. I was uh, you know, programming in first computer, like very early on, on the uh, Atari systems, on the tape decks, right, way back then. Um, and I, I thought computers are great. So, so I, I decided to go to, uh, to MIT, do computer science, like engineering. This is actually not my first autonomous robot. This is actually several, like second generation already of autonomous robots. Um, if you look carefully, there's like an iPad, a compact, one of the really older days, and this is like the latest thing. Right? And this is the only picture that exists because before that was, they didn't have digital cameras. So, so that kind of tells you a little bit. Um, but but so, so, you know, I really got interested in uh, very technical and uh, computer related things, right? Um, and from that experience, I, I, I formed a company with some uh, startup, with some friends, doing computer graphics for mobile devices, it's these so called smart devices back then, you know, these Nokia bricks running Symbian 1, 2, and 6. Symbian 6 was really cool, but now who even knows about Symbian 6 anymore? <laughs> right? They're as dead as Nokia. Um, and so, but, but during that experience, what the key takeaway was that I was actually applying a lot of my technical engineering skills into looking at uh, business, looking at business data, right? Because we had what we thought was a really great product, you know, I was an, a young engineer, probably a little bit more confident than I should have been, um, and thinking we, we build a great product and they'll come. We build a great product and they didn't come. So, so I was like, okay, well, let's analyze the data. Let's, you know, where's the market? What's the estimated demand and all these things. So I applied all those mathematical models to business models. And I realized, wow, that's actually really hard. You know, yeah, we can do some simple aggregation, some pivot tables in Excel, but if you go anything beyond that, it's actually quite complicated. And the reason why is because social systems are much more complex than engineering systems. <coughs> okay, they're more amorphous. The boundaries are not as, as clear. I think that's going to be a, a, an ongoing theme that you're going to see uh, today. That we'll talk about how we do this. So it's a little bit of a naive approach to say that we're going to. Take look at social systems as an engineering system. Okay, and then we'll miss out and sometimes get things uh, hazardously wrong when we do this. Okay. So, so, so as we mentioned, now I'm in the Department of Information Systems. I'm also teaching at the NUS Business Analytics Center, which is a cross-disciplinary center. Uh, we have a master's in business analytics. We also have an undergraduate degree in that as well. Um, and we've been having a lot of good time uh, teaching students and working on uh, OBE as one of the students. Um, and, and former students, I guess now you're, we're trying to get you out. 
Um, and uh, having a lot of fun looking at the data from various different companies in Singapore and in the world. Okay, so what's my end of this life? So I, so I went, decided back to go back to school after working for a few years. I uh, went back to Harvard um, and just a couple of streets down. And uh, so now my research tends to focus on more social networks and really social sciences, media, retail, consumer deep retail. Um, and what I want to focus really on is that one of the big things is causality. I'm going to try to push. I would say, you know, if my students can uh, address causality, if my PhD students, they can graduate. Um, I think one of my PhD students is here. How, how far are you away from causality or graduating? <laughs> so, so it's a hard bomb, right? And, and uh, it's, it's definitely not going to be easy, but I think the value is quite big. Okay, so we're going to try to push down that route. Okay, uh, so right now I'm teaching a lot of CRM, analytics, and also healthcare analytics, um, and also do a little bit of analytics and consulting on the side and talking to companies. So the companies we've talked to are like including media companies. Viki is one of our partners that we've been working with quite a, quite a bit recently. Um, in Facebook, we do a lot of retail. Um, Chengi uh, Wingtai Group uh, does a lot of like uh, Fox Fashions, G2000s, all those guys. Um, IT and tech, Singtel, HP, Lenovo, Autodesk. Um, and also been working a lot on these newer platforms that do like microfinance or like crowdfunding and so forth. So it's really broad and anything that deals with consumer um, data is something that I'm interested in. So, so I want to say this is also an, an invitation if you're working with companies that you think that there could be an interesting collaboration, then we, you know, we can see, talk about that and see what we can do as well. Okay. Um, so, so one of the reasons why uh, analytics is becoming so popular right now is just because there's so much data out there. If you want to know what can we do with this, right? It's coming from, of course, traditionally in the 90s, 80s, and 90s, it's from POS systems. Okay? Um, and and, and e-commerce took on, and then we have our GPSs, our data, and then we have a lot of uh, Forex and a lot of trading, right? And, and uh, now we have like more data from like uh, macroeconomics, Singapore inflation rates. Um, now, and then the big ones came in, right? Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, my friend, Fensters. My face and so forth. And these things just brought us so much data, and the people were asking, well, "What can we do with this?" Okay. Um, and then the next big jump was, I would say, mobile devices. Right. All the telcos, the Singtel, pretty much just knows your location almost 24/7. It knows that you're here. Knows that other people are here. Knows where you're going. Knows how, how long you, you spend at work. Uh, which which canteen or uh, restaurants you're visiting and so forth. Right. So much data. Okay. Um, IoT is bringing that to a whole new level. And, and then, of course, a lot of smart nation, ERPs, now, now the government's launching uh, the, the, the satellite um, GRP, which is going to also be a lot of data, right? And easy link and so forth, okay? So, uh, but what, what I'll give an example a little bit is today, is on social media analytics. So I want to talk about causality, but then I want to apply it really to social media, because there's so much interest in this. And I'll talk about a little bit about our research about how we can bring some causality into social media, okay? Okay. Um, we also, so my former students, they look at things like, uh, look, look at Twitter, how happy are Singaporeans, right? Um, and you might say, well, that looks kind of weird. Why is the CBD, why are people so happy in CBD? <laughs> They're usually at work. So we actually, this is a, a video, this, this time is not a video, but they actually show different times uh, the other day and different levels of happiness. So in CBD, usually in the evening, people are out for dinner, like work is over, they're, they're drunk, they're happy, they're treating, you know, drunk photos of themselves, so everyone's good. Right, um, and then usually in, in, in the suburbs and the residential area, they're of course more happy during the day. At night, they have to manage with kids and you know, maybe less happy. Right, so so you can do a lot of nice visualization. Okay, um, and, but one of my one of the po child poster uh, poster child sorry for an analytics in, is about this for, uh, prime forecasting, and it's a product that's uh, it's called Predpol police prediction, and they're selling it to many police. Uh, departments throughout the United States and the UK and so forth and Singapore to try and get to Singapore as well and, and the idea is that well we, you, you, all the police have these computers uh, in, their, in the cars they can say well this is when the crime's gonna happen next right so it's like wow this is fantastic there's a social benefit to this and it makes sense um, but then a recent article just published about uh, several, a, a week or two ago said something like well police are training big data to stop crimes before it happens but it, but it's predictive policing bias does it even work? Okay, and it gets worse. It says, well, civil li many li civil liberties groups are saying it's actually uh, racial justice organizations argue that algorithms are perpetuating prejudice, 
uh, are they worth the, even the privacy issues that are involved? Right? Basically, these algorithms are saying, let's say in the US, you, know, you see black people cause a lot of crimes, so they're going to target even more black people because they're doing racial discrimination and they're pushing these things that we don't want in society even further. Okay? And, then, and then what's even worse is that the, they said, well, what they find is they're not actually predicting the future, but what they're actually predicting is where the next recorded police office, uh, observations will be. Even worse, really where the, next, where the police will be, not the criminals. Because the police are the ones who are recording the data, that's where they're getting the data source, right? So if, so if I was a criminal, I'm saying, let's use this software, I want to know where the police are, and cause my crime somewhere else, right? And you can imagine that criminals are, even if they don't have the software, they have some sort of heuristic that's sort of doing this, right? You know, I, 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 I'm selling narcotics on, uh, in uh, Holland Village, and then I, some of my friends got arrested, so maybe I stopped selling there, I go somewhere else. They're using these simple logistics, right? And, and the software is saying, no, 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 keep on staking out at Holland Village, and look, our crime rate de declined. It's not the crime rate declined, it's just that criminals got smarter than our algorithms and our prediction, okay? So that's, that's gonna be an issue. Um, and then one of the most ca catastrophic cases I would say was is, uh, really the, the Google uh, flu trends. Um, so when it first came out in 2008, people say, oh my god, this is a, a, an excellent example of using big data to help society. And Google, Google flu trends says, look, using search terms, so Google can predict the amount of flu um, in certain regions in the United States. And, that, and that's going to help to, uh, for the CDC, the, the government officials, to run vaccinations, to run treatment, and preempt Outbreaks. So this is fantastic, right? Um, so Google uh, flu trends can detect outbreaks days before, and even they went on far, further, even months before an outbreak, even a whole season before the outbreak. That's what they're claiming. Okay. Same newspaper three years later says study to Google is much hyped flu trend traffic consistently overestimated flu cases in the U.S. It's a failure that highlights the danger of relying on big data technologies. Okay. And, saying, and, and actually, they go on and say it's costing the government millions of dollars running these vaccines to the wrong locations, and then it, it not treating it, it's not preventing outbreaks. Right? So what's happening here is that Google, uh, you know, th their intent was good, um, but they're somehow trying to predict social systems, and, and it can go quite badly, quite poorly, and it's quite an expensive mistake. You know, in, in their defense, they're, they're getting better, and they're, try they're aware of the situation. Okay? Um, and so what I'm going to say is that one of, the, one of the problems with big data is really it's a, an endless pit of correlations. Right? A lot of these algorithms are based on correlations. So I, I like this site um, which talks about spurious correlations. So what correlations can we find? Internet Explorer is highly correlated to murder rates in the United States. About 0.99. Right? So you know, you're so frustrated with IE you can go shoot someone. Right? Is that the conclusion we're going to make? Right? You have a number of people who drowned by falling into a swimming pool with the number of films Nicolas Cage appeared in. Right? People are suicidal after watching Nicolas Cage films. Okay? U.S. spending on science-based technology and uh, suicides by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation. Right? Uh, it, go it goes on. Divorce rates in Maine uh, is highly correlated with per capita consumption of margarine. Right? If you keep on feeding margarine, I'm going to divorce you. <laughs> Okay. Age of Miss America by murders, uh, by steam, hot vapors, and hot objects. Right? It goes on and on. Right? And so this blogger, is, it's kind of nice They just contribute this really random spoilers correlation with very high correlation, like 0.99 and, and above or so. Right? So this is, just say, if you put this into your model, you might get some really erroneous uh, conclusions. Okay? So what I want to kind of give you, take away of this is um, that when we look at data, social systems, it's really what I call like a, a data iceberg. Okay, so what we see uh, in our data is really above the water. This boat. Okay, say so, okay. Well, I see an iceberg. There must be an iceberg underneath. Yes, that's true. So what do we see above the water? Is that we see okay, it's large data. It's still valid, large, quite large. What's above the water, right? Uh, it's cumbersome to work with. Um, it, in it indicates there is an iceberg underneath. So maybe we should, if we see an iceberg floating above the water, we should avoid it. Okay. Um, it's sometimes sufficient for many of our purposes, right? I mean, that's a, that's a good start. Um, but many times, I'd say it's not. It's really, it can be disastrous, okay? And so what's underneath the iceberg is much larger that we're not capturing in social systems, 
Okay, I think I don't know about my iceberg meteorology too much, but I think it's like ninety percent of the icebergs actually under the water. Okay, and and these are things that you know maybe our our IT systems or our whatever platforms do not are not capturing you know what how humans how social systems are actually behaving. This is what we're missing. Okay, so below it's below the water a lot of unknowns. We don't see the data. It's much larger. Required support. Um, it, but, it, but the underneath here, the main important part is that what's underneath is actually going to help us. It's, it's required for the iceberg to support everything that's above it. Right? If the, if the underneath isn't, isn't there, the top is not going to exist. And if there's a certain structure for it to physically stand up. Right? Otherwise, the iceberg would topple over and other things. So by, by trying to understand the process of how ice is formed, we can understand what's underneath the iceberg. Okay. Um, and so, and then what we can do is, if we understand that process and the mechanism, then we can map what's underneath the iceberg and say, well, if this is what, what looks like underneath, this is what we should see above the water. And then we say, okay, do we see this above the water or not? If we see this, then we can conclude that's what's happening underneath the water. Okay? So that's, that's the analogy we're trying to get at, is that the data is really um, above the water, is good, but we really need to understand the whole more holistic view of the iceberg to, to extract more value out of it, okay? Um, so for business analytics at NUS, we view it that it's really pulling from three different pillars. Okay. So, so we have, of course, traditionally, it's the computer science. And computer science, of course, we have soft, software development, algorithms, databases, data warehouses, and so forth. But we really also need to pull from, borrow from statistics, thing, things like statistical inference. Can we believe the data? How reliable is the data? You know, these p-values um, and so forth. Okay, and, and we can do regressions. We can do a lot of interesting tools. But then, what tends to be missing, what I observe a lot of times, is in in organizations, is that they're missing the social science side. Right? The social science side is, is telling you the process of the iceberg. You don't know what how people behave. You just think people are just robots, or you know, the number five could be five million dollars, five cats. You're crunching the number the same way. The computer doesn't know. Only humans know the difference, right? You should feed cats milk, you know, five million dollars you should keep in your pocket, and, you know, and so forth, right? So that's what we need to capture, okay? So, in, uh, uh, so we formulated in the NUS program as well is that we really try to give students from all three pillars um, to give a better understanding and, and to uh, really extract the most value as we can out of the data, okay? So, I mean, if you have any questions, please just jump right in. Um, you know, we can discuss this, or if it's extensive, then we can take it offline after the talk as well. Okay. So, okay. So what I want to give you then is, uh, well, that's nice and all, but in practice, what can we really do? What are some tools we can use to somewhat get a causality? Okay. And one of my views on this is that, unfortunately, there's not, uh, as, to, as far as I know, there's, there's no automatic tool to do causality. There's no black box. You know, you cannot call up. Microsoft say, hey, can you give me the latest Azure causality box? Plug it into my data, and it jumps. It doesn't work that way. Okay, um, you know Azure makes great products, but it just it's just not technically and feasible to do this. Okay, and and so causality is, is going to be very valuable. And as a data scientist, I would say that's what's going to keep us employed. You know, if your boss can replace you with a, a Microsoft product, that's not, not that's not so useful, right? But but understanding the context, the business process. The psychology is what's going to keep us employed and give us the most value that cannot be replaceable. That's not replaceable. Okay. So, so that's why I'm, I'm giving this talk about causality and saying, okay, we should try head there. It's not always feasible, but we try our best. Okay. Okay. So, what what is causation? Really? So, well, before we get there, so I want to say a lot of times machine learning systems they're not they're really effective at non-social systems. You want to do automatic detection of cancer from fMRI images? Great. They could probably do pretty well. Right? You want to extract like maybe features from an image? Great. But then you're talking about human behavior. Then you can, that's where you, underneath the water is quite big. Okay. Uh, and you know we're assuming that of course if we're smart, then the people we're analyzing are also smart. Right. So if you're assuming that people you're analyzing are not smart, then that maybe says something about yourself. Okay. So, so it's good for finding patterns. Um, it's limited, but I would say there really is limited usage in business context. You can answer much more interesting questions by trying to get a causality and trying to do these, these conceptual games. Okay? And so a lot of questions is, are predictions causal? You know, many times, 
uh, you've got top, comp top companies and in, in my research, people confuse this notion. That they think predictions are causal. That if I assign a certain prediction to obey, you know, or you come back to school for your PhD, uh, you will probably 50%. How do I know that that 50% is truly accurate about like really testing it, right? And, and I can assign any, any number I can assign. I can say 9999 nine, nine to everyone, and that's fine too. It's just as good as a random number. We, we, can, we don't really know, okay? So predictions are, are limited. But sometimes it's the best we can do. I, I understand that. Um, so, so, but then, ideally in causation, is that we're trying to ca draw some sort of inference between X drives Y. X and only X and nothing else but X, okay? It's not because of spurious correlations, it's not because of uh, you know, some other confounds that we're missing. And this is really important because if you're talking to your manager and saying, well, let me change X, <coughs> then you can guarantee with, certain, with a certain level of, of certainty that, X, that Y will also change. Okay? So this is very actionable. This is very directly actionable. Right? So you think about the Google flu trend, if you say, okay, well, this is what's driving people, driving flus, if I change X, I can actually reduce the, the flu uh, incidence in that region, right? It's not just prediction. I'm not saying there will be 10 cases of flus in this region. It's actually saying I want to reduce it, okay? Um, but the problem with data is a lot of times we can only see correlation or some form of correlation. Maybe it's not linear correlation, you know, some not linear models, SVMs, whatever it is. It's more or less just occurring co-occurrences of data, of two variables, okay? Um, and why do we see this? There's really three reasons for correlation in our data. One, of course, is we would love to see causality. X causes Y. Okay. But then we also can get reverse causality. Y actually drives X. It's the opposite of what we're doing. This is really disastrous if you're trying to uh, advise your boss what to do. Because you're saying, well, if I change X, then Y would come out. But, but no, it's actually the opposite of the way around. You put in X, nothing happens, or it's even worse, it may be the opposite. Okay? Um, and then there may be also unobservables something else outside the system that's driving this. this uh, these confounds, these unobservables are below the water. We do not have data on this. So how can we capture this structure into our models, okay? And, and so, so this, this is kind of gives us a big outline of where we're going, okay? Um, of course, you know, we take our classes, we'll go more in, in detail on, on also the methods and, and approaches. I just want to get and give you an introduction to this, okay? So what do you mean by causality? So really, you know, a lot of times people say that the gold standard in causality are these A-B testing on systems or clinical trials in, in medicine, right? So in clinical trials, um, they do like usually double-blind clinical trials. So if I'm going to test a new drug, I'm not going to tell the, the, the nurse administering the drug uh, which one is the placebo, the sugar pill, which one's actually with the active ingredient, okay? And, and so, if we do this with enough with two similar groups, one that has the drug and one that has the placebo, the sugar pill, then we say, well, X cures Y, serotis paribus, meaning everything else is controlled for. Two similar groups of people, it's not the nurses, maybe nurses say, psst, 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 this is the treatment one, and that changes your psyche and changes your, your reaction to the drug, okay? So, so really, that's why double binding drugs are very, very useful. Um, but, but the most important part is without X, there, it does not change Y. So, it's, so we're trying to isolate like X and only X and not anything else but X, okay? And so without intervention, uh, but the problem is that when we look at our data, a lot of our data tends to be historical data, right? If we can do A-B testing, many, many sites, many tech sites can do this, fantastic. Uh, in, but the way we do A-B testing, we should also be careful about. That's a separate issue that we won't talk about today. Uh, but the problem, but what I want to focus on is that what happens when you cannot intervene? We could not change and try different treatments. What can we do to still get causality out of this? Right, now I'd say majority of times this is the case. Right? Your boss says, well, we want to try a new product, a new scheme, or some sort of new adventure. You haven't done the test on that yet. So you have to produce some number, um, and can we get to some understanding of this? So that's what we're going to try to focus on. Without intervention, using only historical observational data, can we get causality? Okay. Is that going too fast? Everyone's dazed? Uh, amazed, lost, or sleepy? Or if you yawn, you, I was saying, now there's a new study, if you yawn, uh, people with bigger brains yawn longer. So, so if you're going to yawn, you have to yawn for a long time. 
Okay. 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 So, so let's consider this this issue. Okay. Uh, what we call the paradox of prediction and causality. Right. So, prediction a lot of times is about minimizing error. Right. Like you can do cost validation, you can minimize the error, and then you do good fit. Okay. But let's, let's imagine that we have this system, um, this theory. Okay. That let's say it, it is uh, education attainment. How many years of education you have in X? Right. It has a, a causal effect on Y, your earning. You know, so the university doesn't like me to tell you this, because it, but it's saying if you come to our school, you can get an ROI for you know, two more additional years of master's program. You can increase your ROI by, uh, I don't know, 10K you know, per month for the rest of your life. That's what, we, that's what the, the conclusion we might get, okay? So, but the problem is that what if there's some other variable, W, that's beneath the water that we don't see, confound. That's actually driving both. Okay, so so maybe you're a really smart person. So because you're smart, you're going to be able to get admitted to these programs, top programs, PhD programs, and so forth, right? And it's also going to drive your earning. So even without education, you just go to work and your boss knows, oh, you're really smart. So I'm going to give you a raise and give you an increase. Okay. So the idea is that you know we want to say x times y, but there's this w that we cannot measure, that we, we don't know about beneath the water. Okay. So what do we do? So let's try just a simple simulation test. This is um, Python kicking in. It's a Python talk. Um, so what we're trying to simulate is this network of causality. Okay. So I'm using pandas, right, um, and and uh, it's SciPy and NumPy here. So we're going to try to generate uh, 100,000 people. Okay. So you can do just 100,000 rows. We're going to draw a random number w. So everyone's going to be normally distributed on how intelligent they are. Okay, mean zero, but that matters less, okay? And then we'll say x is uh, 0.5 of w, okay? Plus some random noise. I mean, you know, random noise happens, okay? And then we'll say, okay, y then is your, your income is uh, a function of how smart you are, let's say by a weight of 30, 0.3, and then your education, let's say a weight of 0.4. So, you know, education still helps you more than being smart, okay? And then some random noise, okay? And then I put it in, into a data frame. Okay, we're, we're happy. Okay, so now I'm gonna try to do a linear model to predict the income. Okay, so let's see what happens. So, so this is what we get. Sorry, uh, that's, uh, okay, screenshot's a little weird. Okay, so, so here's the linear regression. So first off, what should be the correct model in the linear model? It should just be well, if it's a correct model, I mean, okay, yeah, you're like, well, I don't know what the correct model is. That's right, <laughs> right? But, but, but in our data, all we have is this x and y. So we're going to try to run a naive model to say a uh, linear model of uh, y is a function of x, okay? So that's what we're going to do here, exactly here. So we do this, it builds out a lot of gibberish, blah, 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 some fancy numbers. Okay, great. But we're going to try to do a similar model. Sorry, this is my, uh, I had some transparency turned on, so that's why you see the little background here. So I'm going to try to run a similar model with w. So y is a function of x and w, okay? And, I want, and, and what, what I want to do is actually, I should be able to back out these weights, these correct weights. Let's focus on x for now, okay? So what do we see? So, so first of all, what should the x be? What should, what should the correct x be when I back it out? About looking at the results. What should the x be? If I run the correct model. So 0.4, right? If I run that, let's say this is the correct model. I'm trying to back this out. It should be 0.4 and then 0.3 and W. Okay? So what do I get? So if I run the incorrect model, I get 0.5. But remember, I don't have W. So here, if I have W, that's correct. 0.4 and 0.3. Okay? So here, so this is going to be very worrisome. I'm missing a variable W here in my data. And if I run it into my model, yes, R will tell me something, or Pandas, or Python, or whatever else you're uh, using, will tell me something. You see that's actually the p-value is also significant, very significant, right? And you tell your boss, just get more educated, or just, you need to send me to school, because I'm gonna increase my salary by, you know, 50%, right? And, and the boss says, no, no, you're just a smart guy, so go away, but maybe not anymore after you told me this, okay? So the point I'm trying to take away is that, if the correct model should be this. You can back out the correct weights, but the problem is if you don't have it, it's, you get very biased estimators. 
very wrong values. Okay? So, but it's considered a slightly different variation of this. What if you get this variation? Okay? So we're going to say, um, still number of education and salary. But then W is, let's say something, uh, both X and W uh, cause, uh, X and Y cause W. And, and W could be the amount of money you spend on art. Okay? If I'm really educated, I really appreciate all the classics, uh, then I'm willing to buy a really expensive art. Right? If I don't understand Picasso, I think Picasso is just like my child's uh, watercolor work. Okay? But also, if I have more money, of course, then I can afford Picasso. Right? So, so it's driving both. So similar setup. I generate x as a random variable, y as 0.7 plus, so, y, so uh, y is a function of x, the weight should be 0.7, and then my w then is a function of uh, x and y, so 1.2 of x, 0.6 of y, and so forth, okay? But still, uh, I'm trying to estimate my, my y here, okay? So let's look at this. So I've got a simple model um, of just x and y, okay? And I'm going to compare that to running a model of, of x, y, and w. Okay, and, and, yeah, we're gonna have screen space a little bit here. So first, so let's look at the x then. What do we see? So x here should be uh, 0.7, right? So here, we, we don't have w. Let's say we don't, or even if we do have w. Okay. If we don't include it, that's a correct model. All right, max out 0.7. Okay, with w, um, it's not the correct model. So it gives us the wrong estimate. This is fine. This is good. We don't want to put the correct value there, okay? Because this is gibberish. This is an incorrect model. But but then look at our r squared. What's happening here? So this is the wrong model. This is the correct model, okay? And what's happening on our r squared here? So r squared tells you how how much variation in y is explained with your in in your x by your x variation x, okay? So high r squared means it's a better fit. Right, so best fit is r squared of one, the best fit. It's like a straight line, okay? But what you see here is that in the wrong model, your r squared is 0 0.5. In the co correct model, your r squared is actually lower. Right? This is really problematic. If I'm blindly just predicting, it's saying, look, you know, R, Stata, Python, whatever your favorite MATLAB program, Fortran, whatever it is, it's gonna tell you that this is the correct model. And, and this is the better model. Your estimate is incorrect, right? And your model itself is just incorrect. Okay, and then you tell your boss something ridiculous and he's gonna probably fire you. Okay, so, that's, so, this, is, so this is known as a collider. The previous one was known as a, a confounder. Okay, so this should hopefully pique your interest a little bit uh, and, and, and try to get that raise from your boss. Okay. So let's talk about some examples here of my favorite thing, user-generated content on social media. Right? The idea is that you know, Twitter, uh, you can become rich by analyzing Twitter data. Um, all you're doing is just getting the, the founders of Twitter rich, but I guess Twitter's struggling now, so maybe you'll get founders of Microsoft rich, because you know, they're going to be sold to Microsoft, I think, right? uh, or something. Okay, okay but anyways, um, so the classic example is that we want to say UGC, user-generated content, uh, predicts some sort of outcome. And really, I want to say the stronger thing. It, drives, it causes the outcome. Whether it's product sales, whether it's like elections, whatever it is, right? You, you're analyzing your Twitter data, and you say, okay, well, people love Samsung Note 7. So, you know, I love the exploding ba battery. I can use it as a grenade. It's fantastic. So it's gonna drive up the sales, right? Okay? But, but, but then, but so, you know, a lot of people have looked at like, so okay, what about, what's the value of, say, like, say, Facebook follower? You have all these fan pages. People, Nike's putting in 900 million dollars per year to ma maintain their social presence, to maintain the, their Facebook fan page. So they want to know what is the ROI of each follower. And so there's a couple of studies uh, looking at, well, okay, what is it? So some people say 360, some people say 2293, some people say 136, some people say 294, some people say zero, right? If you're doing like a cattle competition, you average all this and you get the right answer, right? You are, you, you're, you're a gradient, gradient boost and then you average millions of models together and all your competitors' models and you get the best answer, right? That's, that's how Kaggle works. Um, so, so instead then, um, so, so the point I'm trying to get is, you know, a lot of these models you're finding the issues with them because they're not able to draw some sort of causality at it, at it right? How can you draw causality? Can you even do, do this, okay? Otherwise you get, you might as well draw a random number. 
So, so uh, another study was done saying, can we use social media to predict election results? You know, Trump followers are really uh, uh, vocal, right? Um, and there are a lot of tweets in, in, uh, about Trump, right? About like, uh, this is 2016, uh, was it women's rights and all this stuff. You know, the volume just, tweets that mention Trump is huge. Huge, right? I cannot do this. Um, but then people were studying, well, there's one uh, academic saying, okay, he did a survey in, of all the different studies basically said, there's no way that we know. And the title of the paper was, I wanted to predict election with Twitter, and all I got was this lousy paper. Basically saying, I did not find anything that was significant for prediction, okay? So, so this should be kind of rather worrying for us, okay? Um, other, other things, so we want to really say, there's some sort of, the desired interpretation of say, like, let's say book reviews, okay? is that user read positive reviews on Amazon and then choose to buy the book. That's the assumption that we want to make, okay? But the problem is that when we look at this, there, there might be a, a reverse explanation, a reverse causality. That user who are happy with the product write positive reviews, right? How many people here have written a review on any website? A few of them, higher than normal. But, but how many people have analyzed data on reviews? So the number of people who analyze the data is, is surpassed the number who write, write reviews. <laughs> okay, so, so there should be there should be some some concern here, right? If you don't yourself write reviews, how can you? Why why would you some other people write reviews and use it for your analysis? I always kind of make it very reflective. If I don't do something, most likely other people won't, won't do it. Okay, so that so there's some reverse causality going on here, and then there's also this confound is that maybe the firm is doing some other. Um, this is below the water data. They're doing other efforts to promote the book, like, you know, like book signings, book, uh, all the other things that's driving both reviews and product sales. But we cannot observe this. Okay. Okay. What else is happening? Other factors. We don't know how good the book really is. Right? Maybe it's a really good book. Maybe it's a really crappy book. But we can't tell from reviews. Right? That's the other implicit thing is that we wanted to say reviews and ratings imply some sort of product quality. But that's not necessarily true. Um, it may be some publicity. Reviews may not be the true opinion of people. Um, in my class, I think uh, uh, I'll be remembering a couple of funny examples on, on book reviews on Amazon. Um, some people are writing like very long, extensive novels about uh, child slavery and like uh, very funny ones. And like this is a whole community of Amazon viewers writing like novels. Really, uh, they're, they're other authors and they're like unemployed English majors trying to get publicity. And then you know, they're, and they're like usually rated as the most useful reviews, right? So it's this whole sarcastic thing going on on, on there. Okay, so maybe not be uh, reviewing the, the true opinion, and may also be, be reviewing the true quality of the product. Okay, maybe some early adopters. Yes, Samsung phone Note Seven is fantastic, right? And then the early adopters got blown up. It's like okay, maybe not so fantastic. You know, I think it said forty percent. They're losing more than forty percent people from this Note Note Seven. That these people are going to switch to other phones, mostly to iPhones after this. Right. Um, and also selection bias. Right. So maybe some people who are very happy or very unhappy about the product will do the review. Because right. you know, you buy, I'm, sure, I'm assuming most people have bought products on e-commerce sites at some point or another, right? But the fact that you don't write on it says something. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so I want uh, uh, my time's running a little short, so I'll try to quickly give you a brief overview of different identification strategy. Identification strategy here is basically saying, what can methods can we do to target a causality? Okay, so you borrowed from the econometrics um, literature and, and methods. Okay, so it's a bit, it's going to be different from CS machine learning. Okay, so so most, first and most important thing is we must understand the context. Are we looking at social media? Are we looking at uh, Cats, are we looking at the election results? We must understand the context. Okay, we must understand the process of this iceberg. Okay? Um, and so these are the, the five major techniques which I'll briefly go over. Um, just kind of introduce you guys. We can discuss it over offline. You can Google it. You can, you can come to take our classes, pay us money, and we'll guarantee that you can increase your salary. Um, not really. Um, but, but honestly, we, our patients have been very good, um, very high placements on this program because of this. Okay? Um, so, so we'll just go one by one. Okay, so in the ideal case, let's first start with the data. Okay. A lot of analysis tends to be what's known as cross-sectional data. So each of these are, are user data, say, and we just have one snapshot of them. Okay, 
Um, but that's not going to tell us too much. And you'll see why in a little bit. But in panel data, what we want to see is actually a repeated observation of the same user. So we want to see them over time. Okay? And then multiple. So we have n uh, users. We want to observe them for across t periods of time. So then we have our matrix is going to be n times t matrix, large. And we can do this with our big data, right? We should do this with our big data. That's the, that's the cool thing about this, right? You're not running like surveys that you ask people once a year. You actually can observe every millisecond what they're doing, okay? So, so we have this data context, okay? Um, whoops, hello, okay. So what we're going to try to do is then try to assign then, let's say, I'm going to focus on uh, linear regression models just for simplicity to illustrate the point. But you can actually do this in more than just uh, this method, linear models, okay? Um, so one of the first thing is we're going to try to assign, say, a dummy variable for each entity, for each user, okay? And, and, and why do you want to do this? It's because there's a lot of time invariant factors about that person, about that book that we cannot observe, okay? So, so uh, there's many un unobservables, and we cannot separate them. So for example, you want to say, well, you know, uh, it, 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 women are smarter than men, okay? Uh, uh, it, it, most people don't change their gender in their lifetime, okay? But their gender is also highly correlated to many other things, like your height. Maybe, you know, it's shorter, it, it, because women are shorter, they conserve energy more, and more energy goes to their brain, we don't know. Many other things, right? But in our data, we can observe this. So we want to eliminate all the time invariants um, as much as we can. In, uh, in CS terminology, sometimes we call this like autoregression, right? But we just have to say, okay, let's just eliminate this. We cannot observe this, okay, for causality purposes. So what's left then is really time variance. If you look at our data, anytime, anything that fluctuates in time, maybe it can help us to explain um, that causal effect, right? Um, like if, say, price changes over time for a book, then we say, what's the effect of price? Right? And, and for all the different books. We don't know the quality of the book. The book might be good, might be terrible, um, but, but we don't know the effect of price on book sales. Okay? So, we, so that gives us some explanation of the time variance. Okay? And it also reduces reverse causality, especially when you use something like a lag time. Okay? So, so, uh, so example, so this is a little bit, this is my animation didn't quite work out. Well, so I, I simplified the model a, a little bit, but we're going to say sales of book I at time t, okay, is then some sort of function of, uh, we have a dummy for book i. So if you have, you're looking at a thousand books, you can have a dummy, a binary, is it book one? No. Is it book two? Yes. Is it book three? No. So if there should be only one book for, for, for that book. Okay. So if there's, n, uh, if there's n number of books, you should have n minus one dummies. Okay. So let's eliminate that. So this is going to capture all of our time invariance. Okay. And then what we're going to focus on is really something that's time varying. Let's say ratings. Right? And we can have our beta here for our linear model of i, book i, and then we're going to say t minus 1 in the previous time period, whatever you define time period, maybe, maybe daily, maybe microseconds. Okay? And, then this, and then some idiosyncratic, some error terms, for, that's i and t. Okay? But, but, but the point here, the intuition I want to take away is that when we do this, we know that rating, looking forward, has an effect on sales. Right? And this gives, gives us, this at least eliminates reverse causality. Okay? So that's, a, that's an easy takeaway. The one that m most packages support panel model. Okay. Um, next step is maybe we want to compare uh, something known as a difference in difference approach. Okay. And we want to compare really uh, before and after of control and treatment group. So remember, this is over time. Right? So we have two groups. One has whatever treatment that is, and um, it, the price change, and the other one did not. We want to observe before and after. What this does is that it controls for time invariance and it also controls for time variance. Right? Maybe there's a seasonality effect. You're looking at book sales. Around holidays, you know, people, people buy a lot more on e-commerce or in, in general, everywhere. Right? If you don't have that control, you don't know if that lift, the boost that you get is because of holidays or it's because of you know, price changes or something else that you're trying to test. Okay? So that's the idea. Um, so time variance, such as holiday seasons, so example, some sites that look at like Amazon versus Barnes and Nobles for the same book. Okay? So the idea is if they if you look at the number of reviews for the same book, it controls the book quality. It's the same book. It doesn't matter where you buy it from. Right? Barnes and Nobles, I guess, is no more, or is it still going on? I guess Borders is gone. But Barnes and Nobles is still struggling, right? But major book sales, okay? 
Um, and so, and so uh, I look at sales of time I, uh, of book I time T, um, and it's going to be a function of whether it's on Amazon or Barnes and Nobles. That's just a dummy variable. And then I look at the ratings on that site. So is, um, it, whether you know maybe maybe there's some fluctuations, differences between Amazon and Barnes and Nobles in ratings, right? So maybe maybe people are more sarcastic on Amazon and then more pleasant on Barnes and Nobles. Okay, but that's going to be captured by the site fixed effect dummy. Okay. And then what we're going to do is that we're going to try to multiply them together as an interaction term. And this is going to say, you know, the effect of being on Amazon and having this rating gives us like an extra boost. So basically it's giving a, a strong causality of the effect of rating, right, compared to the rating on, on Barnes & Nobles. Right? And Barnes & Nobles already has a baseline rating. So we're controlling for that with, with, with this dummy. Okay? So that's, that's one way of doing it. Uh, so my research on this is, uh, so I work with Facebook uh, for, quite, for quite some time now, um, and we look at uh, how do people make friends on social media, which is a big, really big talk, you know, everyone's going to add, uh, everyone probably says add friends on Facebook, say yes, 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 and you know, someone you don't know, someone you, don't, you know, right, but what we want to know is how do people make friends, um, but the problem is that if you just analyze this naively, people will argue, well, you know, are Facebook friends real friends or are they just kind of like pseudo friends? Okay, or a lot of my ex-students, right? Um, and so, and so we we look at then 1.3 million college students in the U.S. Um, and then we look at the treatment group here is the hurricane, a disaster hits five of the universities, completely demolishes them, and and then we want to see what happens. How do you change a friendship, right? So that's our treatment group, and then we have the, con the control group, which are similar university students um, at non-affected areas. Okay, and so the idea here visually, you can just kind of see. Uh, the big takeaway here is uh, number of friends doesn't change, but who you make friends with, you change. The red is the, the hurricane group, and the blue is like the non-hurricane group, and the vertical line is when the hurricane hits. So you see it's before, the, it's, they're very similar, and then afterwards it diverges. Right. And that's a classic different diff approach. Um, if we didn't do this, there's also some seasonality uh, effects, because every time in the fall season in the U.S., in September, everyone comes, and suddenly everyone makes friends with everyone. Right? And then after like, the first exam, then you only make friends with the smart kids. Okay? And, and, then, and then after holidays, you, like, then you, you go back to making friends with uh, the, the ones who give you presents, right? and so forth. So there's huge seasonality. That's why we're doing this different. Diff that's, so that's, that's a very powerful tool if that's feasible in your context. Okay? Hello, my, how my time is? How am I doing on time? Hello? Okay. okay. Um, probably a more common technique is something known as an instrument variable. This is getting a bit more technical. Um, and so this is saying that, okay, well, since many things can be correlated to X and Y, can we find a Z in our data that's only correlated to, our Z is correlated to our X, but not to our error term, or, or known as our, our Y, okay? So what's going to do is, do is it's basically going to capture the correlation, uh, um, the, the, the vari uh, variance of X, the part of X that's correlated to, uh, uh, that's is isolated, right? So what's only left is that we can then say X affects Y and not with some sort of reverse causality, okay? So X captures all the correlation and isolates only X, all right? Z correlate captures all the correlation. Right. See what I write, not what I say, okay? And even then, don't, don't see what I write, see what I mean, and not what I say or write, okay? Um, okay, so example, again, back to our book example, is sometimes uh, people look at state taxes as an instrument on the effect of price. So on Amazon in the United States, they start rolling out some, ta some, some laws on state taxes, sales tax, if you're buying across borders. So on Amazon itself, without tax, everyone faces the same price. But, some, but it's the same book, same, same price, base price, but then the tax gives you an extra boost. So then does it affect the, uh, the sales of the book? Right? And you, you'd probably assume yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think one of my favorite methods is probably this regression discontinuity. So I have two favorite methods, DID and regression discontinuity is another method. And the idea is that it's take, it takes advantage of things like rounding mechanisms in, in ratings. Okay? So, so if ratings, the idea is, let's say stars rating on Amazon, if you believe ratings affects demand, purchase. You know, I'm, reading, I'm, I'm reading the ratings, and if it's a five star, I buy. If it's a four star, I don't buy. Okay? But my question is, um, if you, that's, true, that's the treatment, then any rounding would actually uh, be show in our sales. And it's not because of reverse causality. Maybe people who like the book or people who are paid to do reviews give it higher rating. Okay. 
Um, so, so, so because of rounding, there should be a discontinuous jump near the, uh, the boundaries of these rounding uh, areas. Okay? So, so let's consider then, uh, this is what it's going to look like. Let's say uh, this is the ratings between two and three stars. Okay? And this is like the potential cells. My theory is that because of rounding, it's going from 2.49 to 2.5, the stars on the website jumps from two stars to three stars. If that's the case, you know, a book that's rated at 2.5, maybe that's an indicator of its quality, but to the potential buyer, it looks like a 3.0 3 star book, <coughs> right? So, it, it's, so if we're looking at these jumps, I can look at these um, rounding, I can actually see a jump in the data um, in terms of sales. That, that tells me that ratings and stars do have an effect um, on the buyer. Right? And it, makes, it helps me to choose whether to buy the book or not. Okay? So that's a very clever use of, uh, of, of modeling. Okay? Um, and so the, the model, again, the regression model could be very simple. We just have some sort of binary variable, R, that says whether it's rounded up or, or not. It's one if it's rounded up and zero otherwise. Okay? So that's, if you consider it without the R first, it just sales as a function of ratings. Straightforward. This, it'll give you the straight line. Okay? But then you say the, if, 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 it's rated, if it's rounded up near the boundary, then you should see this sudden shift. And we spit it to the model, you see, it, and if it's significant, then it gives you confidence that people do care about the ratings. Okay? So I think a lot of your context, a lot of people who are working at data scientists will probably see, have some sort of ratings variables. So you can probably use this technique quite readily. Okay? And, then, uh, uh, and then probably the final method that we like to use is something known as uh, propensity score matching. And this is to construct a, 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 to conceptualize a control sample. So we have some sort of treatment, you know, price changes. Can we conceptualize a similar group of people in similar in every other dimension except what we're trying to test? Okay. Um, so, so that's going to be our control group. And then we put it into our DID models or whatever um, our other models are. So, so then the score then should, should include every other variable which you believe affects the dependent variable, affects the outcome. Okay. Then you can model as a dummy model variable in your main model. You can even do just a simple t-test. You can do it various other ways to compare the treatment group with the control group. Okay, so that's the idea of the PSM. Um, so for the hurricane paper I mentioned you, so I mentioned we use PSM to find the control group. Right. So in CS terms, it's called like the nearest neighbor method, k nearest mirror, whatever it is. It's basically create a distance. Right. Find the closest people in every other dimension except the one you're trying to focus on. Okay. Um, and then, of course, we can combine methods. We can combine, like, so as I said, um, we combine uh, the control sample using PSM, and then it can do, it can conduct a diff and diff, or mod model in linear ways, or whatever we want to do, okay? So I just want to conclude um, the talk a little bit. Um, so, you know, with icebergs, uh, some, people, some people probably thought I was going to go here. Yes, I went here. Um, we want to avoid a, 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 a terrible disaster in you know, analytics. That's why I'm saying we need to be responsible. Right? Prediction has its own use cases, has its own limitation. We should interpret prediction appropriately. Okay? But, but if it's not a causal model, then we should not say it's causal. We should not say change x to drive y. Right? Or you can now even say that what we estimated from a linear model is the weight of x on y. You cannot even say that. Right? You can only say, okay, our prediction model says 50%. No, that's it. That's all we can pretty much do. Okay? So we want to avoid, uh, so we see the data, the iceberg, iceberg above the water. Okay? Um, and then predictions are generally, I would say, fairly weak on social systems. Engineering systems, fantastic. You know, driverless cars, not bad, right? Um, but for a analytics, when you're dealing with people, businesses, anything that requires, you know, someone with a brain that's smarter than a computer, um, then it usually doesn't do so well. Okay. Um, so that's why I, I, I'm, I'm preaching for responsible analytics. Uh, there's a place in, for every method. We just need to uh, understand the limitations of each, okay? And uh, and really, the most value is adding from adding the context. Uh, anyway, again, this is where I think it's going to keep us all employed for quite a while. You know, uh, Deep Blue, I, whatever IBM's latest technology, Microsoft is not going to be able to replace this part um, because they're really missing the context. Okay, we're going forward. Okay. So I uh, thank you. Um, so you can try and find me on, on LinkedIn. Uh, I also, as I mentioned, this is also an invitation. If you're interested to have some context, we can come in and take a look um, to do some sort of research collaboration. Uh, we do quite a bit of this. This is how we're 
building new insights on how people are, are in the industry are using analytics as well as understanding fundamental human behavior. Um, and if you're interested, also, you know, our master's programs or our undergrad programs, I see some of our undergrad students are back there as well. You can ask them how, how they feel about it. Uh, maybe not before exam time, they might feel less positive about it, but that's the uh, that's selection bias from reviewers, right? <laughs> Tell this. Okay? Right, thank you. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll probably stay around for some discussions and we have talks. That'd be fantastic. Thank, thank you. I think someone mentioned that the LinkedIn is not working, quite right? But I think if you look at my photo, it's some version of this. Okay. So this this worked? Without you. Without? Without the queue? Oh, that's strange. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks. Thanks for the talk. Uh, any questions for the talk before we go on for a break, and then we move on to the next speaker? Questions, please. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Getting the predictions correctly. I mean, how bad you how good they are, or how good they can be. I don't know, something that business or something that's effective. So right, so so I think that um, there there are many cases. Um, so I'm, I illustrated the two. Both of those cases were actually, uh, when they first launched, they were considered very positive, very, so the question, sorry, I repeat the question, was, uh, what are some, if I hear correctly, um, is what are some examples of good outcomes of prediction, as well as what's some bad ones, right? Uh, in your experience, uh, yeah. you recently, uh, uh, I would like to understand more about the good cases. So what are some of the good cases? Yeah, so no, I, I, I'd say like, actually, um, my general view is on this is that predictions work pretty well in the short term. Um, and and I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I shouldn't say pretty well. In the best case scenario, it works pretty well in the short term. Like you can make the immediate um, effect maybe tomorrow. But what's really missing a lot of the times is these time varying factors or other, you know, the world around it changes, right? So in the best case scenario, it will work, okay? But, but, the, but the worst case scenario I think it is quite damaging. So I think when, when you know, with this, all this big data hype, we tend to kind of have this uh, over optimistic uh, view of things, but, but I'm saying that you know there are good cases. Uh, Predpol when it first came out, very effective. Uh, Google flu trends, very you know the government saved millions of dollars doing this. So th so at that time it worked really well. Now in hindsight we're seeing that that's not the case, right? So what I'm trying to say is that yeah you probably even in your job and uh, you probably find it probably would work. I'm not saying it, would, it doesn't work, but looking forward. Is that going to continue so, or are you going to run, run into some big, huge iceberg that you don't even see? All right. So I'm not saying that prediction. That's what I'm saying. It's not. I'm not saying prediction is bad. I'm just saying be responsible with your analytics. That, that's that's the main point. Mm -hmm. Actually, there was I think a uh, question here first. Now, okay. huh? yes. Yeah, I'm interested in um, embracing this continuity model that you talk about. So uh, my first question is whether it depends on duration. What kind of relation does it have, like dependent and independent variables have? For example, if um, your relation is linear or averse, for example. And the second is um, maybe you would like to share some of the some of the context that where you can apply this model best. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so two questions. Um, so one is uh, what well, no, no, the uh, whether the linear model makes sense. Is that are you saying you can use it in other ways? Is, is that what? Um, does it only apply for um, yeah. Linear, linear, linear yeah. 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 So right. So this. So the question is, does it apply for other models besides this linear model? And I, I'd say actually all these strategies, most of them can apply to non-linear models as well. But you have to do the math a little bit to to modify them, right? So so. But but the but the intuition is is the same. Is so. Let's say if you have a non-linear model and with discontinuity, that's fine. But uh, we've got like some sort of curvature or like you know inverted U shape. But, but you still believe that, the, you know, maybe you believe that stars have an inverted U shape, right? Like number of stars, not, not, not that everything's super effective, but then you should still see some sort of shift because of the rounding. That's the theory. But what if, like, um, in the future it's, it's going to <coughs> convert to something like steady state, and then at first it's going to be, there's a gap, 
if you run it, but um, at the later stage, it will not, there will not be. Uh, any yeah. yeah. So yeah. Okay. So yes. So then you can do like more uh, analyzing more like subgroups, subgroup analysis perhaps, and so and so you know like for example you know one dollar more for someone with zero dollars is go is really good, but one more dollars for Donald Trump is may maybe worse, right? Um, and so and so you can analyze this, these subgroups first and still do the regression discontinuity to, to help. Um, so I showed an example. So maybe another example is like with the stars. You have like one star, two star, three star, four stars. So maybe you're saying like maybe between one to two is maybe more effective, but then like four to you know four to five maybe not, right? So yeah. So you definitely can do different tricks to 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 segment it further. And then the second question was uh, um, just like um, I just want to hear like some of the best right. context. Yeah. So so yeah. So some of the context. So so I, I mentioned uh, before. So one of them was, was this uh, book reviews on uh, from Amazon compared to uh, number of stars on Amazon. Right. So so uh, you know you know you can you can even do this right now. But Amazon right now is uh, doing rounding by by the by the uh, half. So as you get three point five stars, you get four stars, four point five stars. So the the edges are a little bit more. Refined, but you can still do the same thing. Before they just do the like round to the nearest stars. Okay. Um, another example is uh, you look at like even government policies. I think uh, there's some studies in India, right? Uh, that that uh, if you do, if you take the college entrance exam, some people would be near the threshold. So let's say like 89 to 90, but anyone above 90 would get a scholarship. Someone at 89 would not. You can ar you can argue that people between 89 and 90 maybe you know some random noise. Right? Maybe they're equally as good, it's just we had a bad day, you, you flunked one question. Um, so they analyzed, and if you, you got 90 and you got the scholarship, did that increase y your, your chance of uh, life lifehood success? As opposed to someone who's 90, 89, right? who did not get the scholarship, but should be similar people. So there are a lot of really good examples on this. And you can Google, we can talk about this as well, but there's a lot of examples on, online as well um, using this method. Um, other ones, uh, some of my other students, I'm trying to recall a little bit. Um, we look at also, some of my previous students look at uh, crime rates in the U.S. Um, it, it across st state borders um, because, I'm trying to get this right here, uh, uh, because of uh, guns. Okay? And in the U.S., you know, state borders, there's no border. There's no like, fence or anything. There's this imaginary line that goes through and you can go between cities um, it, it freely. Okay? But when the gun line law uh, suddenly gets implemented in one state versus the other, then somebody wants, you know, someone in the same neighborhood, on, on the same street, one side of the street can buy guns, the other does not. The question is, does that increase the crime rate for this, you know, for some, a similar town, a similar function, um, and also if there's a spillover, you know, people buy guns in one state, run across to the other state and shoot people, as opposed to, you know, someone who's in, in another city in that state that's far away from the border. So there's an imaginary discontinuity, right, that should not happen. Um, there's another study in, in China that also looked at the effects of air pollution um, on, and, and in towns. So there's a, there's a couple of cities where it's divided by a river. And on one side of the river, it's like all the rich people. On the other side, the people are more, more poor people. But they get the same amount of dirty pollution coming down downstream. And so they see, you know, then is, is income that's driving the health problems? Maybe because of, you know, they have the worst uh, health care uh, access or is it because of dietary or education or is it because of air pollution? Right. And so the effect on both sides should be the same because of air pollution, even though the social economic factors may be different. That's another way of using you know, um, discontinuity. Mm -hmm. right. So there are a lot of examples. Um, from very, very good strategy. Yes. question is set Yeah, I mean, I, it's a bit of a related question. But uh, I think uh, we had a talk about deep learning last uh, session. Where does it, your talk leave a model like that? Yeah. Where it's a kind of a big black box sitting right. in between where you have inputs going and outputs yeah. coming out. Your identification strategies, I, I don't see how it can very well fit into a deep learning yeah. kind of a model. Yeah, so, yes, okay, so that's a good point. Which, uh, which is now being touted as like a mother of all models, you can throw everything away yeah, yeah. and just worship deep learning. Yeah. Right? So I think, so I'm trying to make a point also across this. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, is that you know, if, if across the different methods and algorithms, there's like you know, somewhat like uh, automated, uh, unsupervised, whatever you want to call it, right? And then there are things which are very structured models, right? And this whole continuum. So, so I'm saying that, that like, you know, one is to keep us employed. We need to go, go down, down the more structured. 
But I'm saying that not just that, but it's giving a lot more value to the analysis. Because something like deep learning, you know, which is great, they can fit the error, 99% error, that's great, or right, accuracy. Um, but they don't know the, whether the number five is like cats or millions of dollars, mm -hmm. right? So, so, whether, so I'm saying that even the methods I'm showing, illustrating are using uh, linear models. The intuition can be really carried across any algorithm. So, uh, so I'm trying to say is it doesn't even matter which algorithm you want to use, you can adapt it with the same intuition built in. Right. So th I think that's, that's where we're trying to go. Uh, but linear models are usually the most common. Um, and, and if you have a good concept, a good theory, a good hypothesis, you can, you can probably extract it with very simple methods, a t-test even if possible. So should we go with a methodology like uh, we go around and use the linear models or other simpler models to try to find more hidden variables and then throw it on deep learning? Yeah, so yes, yeah. So I, I would say that that's, um, yes. So usually you can do a kind of more exploratory with simple models first. Uh, even some of your statistics, you, know, you can slice or dice your data, like aggregates, uh, aggregation, whatever it is, right? And if there's an effect there, then you can dive deeper. But you usually don't want to dive deep right away because there's such overhead of like, you know, getting, deep st uh, getting your GPU cards, do deep learning, and then kind of massage your data and all this stuff, right? So do simple. Um, and then you can, linear models are fairly simple to get going, but you, we can think about the context a lot more and then go beyond that. So you squeeze out the last percent. How are you um, quantitatively showing that this is causal, causal versus correlated? And what's the yeah, quantitative yeah. output of that? Yeah, so that's a great, 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 great question. So how do we verify that actually this is really causal or not? Okay. Um, so, so if you can close the loop, then you can do a testing. So let's say um, you know, I build like a, uh, a model on customer churn on a, a website. Right? Uh, uh, one of the ones working on is Viki. We do like the customer churn models for them. And then, so we have a model, um, and we have many competing models, and we think that some, we try to build causality into that. Um, but then we, 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 we can do an A-B testing on those factors, right? And, and because we built in, into this model our X, and we believe X is causal, then we can test on X, and see if, how good we are on this, using an A-B test framework. So then you just do like, you just sort of work the law of large numbers, and they're not in the samplings, and kind of back to everything else that you just see. So you definitely can do that, yes. Right. So yeah, you're having another, another issue about these models. That, yeah, these linear models are generally done for like small data samples. So you go up to the blob of millions, everything's going to be significant. Right? Uh, but, that's a, but yeah, you can resample it, you can do other ways too. But the idea is that it's not so much machining, but trying to build in the intuition into our model. Mm -hmm. Yes, questions? <coughs> Yeah, I believe you mentioned that the uh, linear models, they, work, they don't work so well on social systems, right? Uh, and uh, so I, I, I'm just wondering whether, you know, you, when you say social systems, does it mean like, okay, I mean human beings and animals and all that? Because I'm thinking about like, maybe like I'm a pet, a pet food company, and I want to do like an analysis on like, tests on food that uh, cats like, for example. So, would this uh, still apply? Yeah. Yes, yes. yes. Um, for, for, yes, absolutely. Because when you say like, you know, what the cats like, yeah. Um, if your data is from sales of cat food, mm -hmm. then you're assuming that cats cannot buy the food, but it's mm -hmm. actually the pet owner, okay. right? Uh, right? Pets can generate revenue somehow. Okay. Um, so if that's the assumption, then yes. But if you're saying that maybe cats um, are actually just tasting food and whether they yeah. like it or not, yeah. by whatever other metric, then maybe you can do more engineering. Mm -hmm. But you know, this, but then now in pieces, this is actually more a little more philosophical. Is that they're now the last studies showing that animals are actually quite, um, they have like some foresight. Okay. They are a little more cognizant, than you think. Um, but, but, you know, but, but you're right, there's this two extremes. You know, like you program computer software, you kind of know it determines what's going to happen, as opposed to something that's very opaque. Um, and then there's a whole spectrum between. Uh, any more questions for one? Okay, uh, just a couple of questions. Um, you asked, how do you deal with the volatility of social media time service? How do you deal with that? Uh, volatility. Volatility? Uh, volatility. What do you mean by volatility? Like Snapchat goes away, or? Sometimes I look at something like social media volume as a topic, and it's highly volatile. It's like a there's two days of security. There are also like small peaks everywhere, in terms like crisis or yeah. much more things. Yeah. yeah. So no. So so yeah. So exactly. We can we can do all these methods. So you can do a panel model to capture like seasonality. So in the panel model. Um, so in this panel model, you, you can also put in uh, variables for like seasonality, like monthly dummies, for example, that would capture quite a bit of seasonality. 
Um, but then you would need things like, um, maybe ideally, if you have like multiple years, you can capture seasonality better. If you don't, you can still do it just monthly. Like say, like three months, you can still do monthly dummies. So there are there are methods you can you can I can I, 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 uh, deal with that. But I agree with you. Like with social media, you know, there's so much noise and so much spammers and like all these other things that it's really hard to measure. Um, but if you have like a very specific question, then you can take a, leverage these methods a lot more. Um, so, so, but yeah, we can we can talk offline like my, my PhD students uh, and also we can do a lot of um, social media um, analytics on this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think that's all. Let's hear again for go on. Let's let's take like five minutes break and we gather back at eight twenty-five. Steamy in this room. Yeah. <laughs>